Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the current installment of the monthly Dataversity webinar series, Real World Data Governance with Bob Steiner. Today, Bob, along with his guest, Len Silverson, will be discussing Activate Your Data Governance Policy. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. If you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the bottom middle of your screen for that feature. For questions, you'll be collecting them by the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag RWDG. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce to you our speaker for this series, Bob Steiner. Bob is the President and Principal of KIK Consulting and Educational Services and the publisher of the Data Administration Newsletter, TDAN.com. Bob has been a recipient of the Professional Award for Significant and Demonstrable Contributions to the Data Management Industry. Bob specializes in non-invasive data governance, data stewardship, and metadata management solutions. And with that, I will give the floor to Bob uh, to get today's webinar started and to introduce his guest. Hello and welcome. Hi, Shannon. Hi, everybody. Hi, Len. Good to have Len with us on the webinar today. Thank uh, you, Bob. <laughs> and as Shannon said, the, the title or the topic of the, the webinar for today is, is how to activate or basically activating your data governance policy. So uh, um, it's going to be great to, uh, to get some other opinions and, and bring other opinions. And please feel free to chat with us as well and let us know what your thoughts are about data governance policies and things like that. Before I get started, I just want to run through a few things, and then I, then I want to introduce Len. Um, but I, I want, as you know, the, the Real World Data Governance webinar series is the third Thursday of every month. And next month, we're going to be talking about, I'm going to be sharing with you a complete set of data governance roles and responsibilities. Um, I hope you will attend at uh, next month as well. I, I always introduce the, uh, the, the topic of a book that I put out, Non-Invasive Data Governance. Just got done speaking at the Dataversity event, Enterprise Data World, this week. And I'll be speaking at the Data Governance Conference and Data Governance and Information Quality Conference in San Diego in June. I believe that Len will be there as well. Um, also, just real quickly about the two learning plans, online learning plans that are available through the Dataversity Training Center. And especially this month, as it's Data Education Month, um, you can use the code that's shown on the screen to get a 25% discount on not only my courses, but all of the courses that are available through the Training Center. So please give them a visit. Um, Shannon mentioned my publication, the, the Data Administration Newsletter, lots of great quality uh, information there. There's a couple uh, articles um, that are relevant to the topic of data governance policy, and so I hope you'll go and take a look at that. And last but not least, there's the KIK Consulting and Educational Services. I have always called it the home of non-invasive data governance, and now we're at a point where we're talking about non-invasive metadata governance. So I hope you'll take a look at that as well. I want to introduce to you my special guest today is Len Silverston. He's the founder and the CEO of Universal Data Models. He is a best-selling author, and we uh, put up pictures of the different books that he's published, and I uh, hope that you'll take a look at those. If you're not familiar with Len, he should be very entertaining. We're going to have a lot of fun on the webinar today. Um, looking forward to working with him. He's also a winner of a couple DEMA awards, the Professional Achievement Award and the Community Award. He consults in this space, so he's got lots of interesting things to say. And as I said, he'll be speaking at the Data Governance Information Quality Conference in San Diego in June. And with that, I want to uh, say, uh, Len, welcome aboard, and uh, please introduce yourself uh, to the folks in the, uh, in the webinar today. Thank you, Bob. Uh, yeah, I'm very excited to connect with all of you and share information about policy. I've worked, uh, I've helped a number of uh, organizations with their data governance uh, programs. Uh, one of the ones that's listed on this screen, we were very proud that we won the 2012 uh, Best Practice Award. And I'm going to talk uh, not only about this client, but other clients about what we've done with, with policies and other data governance. And uh, I love the field of, I do a lot of work in data models where we resell and license reusable data models, but also reusable business glossaries and also in the data governance space. And today we're going to also be talking, I think, Bob, about some of the human dynamics that go into policies as well. So I'm excited about that. 
And certainly when there's when that topic comes up, and, and Len, your mic's a little bit soft, so maybe if you could speak up a little bit, that would be, uh, we've got a couple comments on that. But, you know, what? the human dynamics part of it is really what this is all about, is really getting, taking your data governance policy and um, getting people engaged with it and understanding what it is, how it's necessary, how it really drives some of the things that we do. So I'm um, looking forward to getting your feedback on these things. Thanks a lot, Bob. I hope this is better. I saw the comments that thought it was hard to hear me. How is this? That's better. Good. All right. So just to let everybody know, the things that Len and I are going to talk about, we're going to try to keep this quite conversational. And I hope you have questions and comments on the things that we're talking about. And the things that we're going to focus on are, first of all, when do you need a data governance policy? And when don't you need a data governance policy? And when is it necessary to put one into place? And then we'll talk about the differences between taking a policy and making it inactive versus making it inactive or you know, what that really means to organizations. Len will share and I'll uh, certainly interject some tips for activating your data governance policy. We'll talk about using the policy to drive data governance and then getting people to follow the policy. That's always a good idea if you're taking the time and effort to put a policy in place. So this is what we're going to talk about. And with each slide, I'm basically sharing uh, several questions that uh, I, wanted, I don't want to necessarily go through them one by one. Like I said, I like to keep this conversational. And so the first question that I have for you, Len, and, and just kind of take a blend of all these different questions, is when organizations have a data governance policy, what are the things that they typically put into those policies? And are there certain times when a policy is absolutely necessary or good to have or actually not necessary at all? So I'm interested in your thoughts on that. Oh, thanks, Bob. You know, I thought about this question because uh, you sent it to me in advance. And uh, I was at Enterprise Data World with you and a number of other speakers. And Michael McMorrow quoted Socrates. And he said, the beginning of wisdom is the definition of terms. So I thought, you know what, um, uh, let's just understand what a policy is. Uh, with, uh, you know, it actually comes from the middle French police. It means uh, regulation and control of a community. Uh, and that's the etymology of it. So it's like, okay, when are you trying to, and I think that applies for data governance policy, like how do we regulate and, and control uh, uh, this community. So, uh, so uh, now, I, my, in my experience, what goes into a data governance policy? Like a whole bunch of things. We have a template with a whole bunch of things. The, the name of the policy, the effective date, the owner, the overview, the scope, the background. I'm reading from a template. The reason, the supporting documents, how to report violations, enforcement, policy contacts, policy change record, and actually there's more. But, uh, but, but, but there's four big ones. Uh, the four big ones. The first biggest one is why. Why? What? What's the reason for the policy? Uh, 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 you could. Uh, another really big one is what is the policy? In plain English, what is it? Uh, and then uh, the 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 third question is how. How do you enforce? How does the policy get enforced? What if you don't follow the policy? And then the fourth big one that I think is who. Who. Uh, created the policy, who's going um, uh, who's going to do the policy? Those, those are the four big ones. What is the policy? Why is it? Who is involved in it and how to enforce it? Okay, and, and you know what that makes sense. I mean, I get that question all the time. Is a data governance policy necessary? And in some organizations, things are are very policy driven, and in that case, it definitely makes sense to um, to have one put into place, especially if you're basically escalating it up to senior leadership to sign that policy. They're not going to sign the policy unless they're standing behind what it is that you're trying to achieve with the policy. Um, and so, the, you know, the idea of, of is there a, an easy answer to the question, is a policy necessary? I've found that it really depends on the client or it depends on the organization that I'm working with or the organization in general. Um, what is your feeling? What are the, some of the things that organizations can look to to determine whether or not it's actually necessary to have a data governance policy? Well, I'm, I'm going to ask you to speak up a little bit more if you would, and if you could close uh, your, your uh, outlook or anything that might be interfering with your audio. You're, you kind of started breaking up there. Thank you. I did close down a number of applications when you said that. Uh, yeah. I'm closing okay. down a few more. And okay. I will speak yeah, up. Better. 
Okay, okay. good. Good. Uh, thank so, thank you. Uh, yeah, if anybody has any difficulty hearing me, please let me know. Um, so, um, in my experience with companies, uh, uh, it takes uh, it could take quite a while to develop a policy, um, and so the the biggest reason why it's necessary actually comes back to that why question. Like, is there a real overriding need for something? Like a big policy uh, that we often do is on uh, data usage or, or data usage limitations. Uh, because uh, especially with GDPR, the, uh, the, the European uh, regulations, to say, hey, what is allowed or what's not? So I think it's necessary. I, I, I've seen companies go overboard on it and create too many policies, and you get involved in legal, and it can actually take quite a bit of time to establish a really good policy. So I would say uh, 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 pick it. Uh, make sure you have a really good overriding, uh, uh, real strong why behind it. That's what I would say uh, uh, that's really going to create business value. Okay, and I think people are still saying that they're having a hard time understanding you because, and it's breaking up on my side too. If there's, I don't know what we can do about the microphone situation, but you know, it would be helpful if uh, if we could rectify that. Um, I understand. Bob, um, well, Bob, let me interrupt. Then, so um, I apologize, and of course, you know, it gets choppy after we start the webinar, fine, and you know, leading up to it. But um, Len, if you have a um, telecom that you, line you can call from. Oh. Okay, I can do that as well. Uh, I just switched it to my audio right from my computer. Is this any better? No. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, Bob, keep on talking. I'm going to call in on the line. Okay, wait, they're saying, they're saying it's not as choppy, but you're quiet. You just need to turn it up. Uh, if I talk like this, is that any better? No. Oh, no. Sure. Okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, technology. In. I'll walk you technology. Uh, I'll, yeah, I know technology is great when it works. I'll, I'll walk you through switching over, but uh, if you want to chat in the meantime, Bob. Okay, sure. And, and so, you know, I think a lot of the things that Len was sharing are a lot of things that are in line with the, what I'm thinking. You really need to have a why. Why is a policy necessary? Um, and again, as I mentioned before, it, it makes sense to be able to um, build it up to the point that the, the people at the highest level of the organization feel that it's necessary to have a policy to implement. And you know, Len gave examples of a lot of different things that go into a, a, a policy. And you know what? It, it, you really just need to address your see what your senior management is thinking about. If they feel as though this is important enough to have a policy in place, by all means, um, put a policy in place communicate it effectively, and it can take time to put a policy together. It, I wouldn't, I haven't seen too many organizations that wait um, real long to, be, to put a policy into place, but it may not be the first thing that they do. It might be something that they do once they've started to establish um, what governance is going to look like and how it's going to work within the organization. Len, do you have anything to add to that? Um, yeah, on timing of the policy, is this any better, by the way? On the on the speaking, it, no. <laughs> so that's what I'm saying. Can you can you dial into the phone number instead of trying to use your microphone? Yeah, uh, I'm looking up the phone number. Um, okay. Glenn, I just sent you instructions. It'll give you. Okay, Bob. Why don't you take it over until I dial it? <laughs> But I'm so soft-spoken and don't never have anything to say. Now, of course, I will do that. And I'm looking forward to having you come back on in a minute. So I hope all of you people understand this is uh, technology in use. So we talked a little bit about you know, if a policy is necessary, and there's not a blank answer that's going to cover everybody. And um, so the next topic that Len and I want to address as we get Len back on the line here is you know, what is the difference between an active and an inactive policy? I've seen a lot of organizations that have policies in place, but they sit on the shelf and nobody really understands it. And in fact, with an organization I'm working with now, 
we've actually created a diagram that relates the policy to a program document. It relates the policy to standard operating procedures and things like that. So it's there. It's active. It's the backbone for everything that we do. But again, it's just a component. Um, putting a policy in place does not mean that you have a governance program. It's just the beginning to demonstrate that there's a high level of support for that program. And let's check to see if, uh, if Len is back. I am still on the bad line here. Um. <laughs> okay. Well, it's, you know what? I, I, it's gonna. Uh, I'm just gonna continue then uh, for uh, for a moment at least. Yeah, continue for a moment. <laughs> so look at so so uh, everybody who's who's listening, you know, I'd be real interested in hearing whether or not you have a policy and what you've put in that policy and how you've activated that policy within the organization. And you know that uh, you know that's always one of the best things about the community that we're we're serving to with this uh, with the webinars with all the things that Data Diversity does is it's great to start conversation around that to and sh if you can share policies that you're working with and how you've taken them from being something that's inactive to something that is now working for people within the organization. So certainly you know check out what the what the the environment calls for, and then. Recognize that there's going to be, it's going to take a little bit of time to put this together. There's models that are available, um, that, and just templates and things to use for that. And as I said, Len had shared some of the things that go into the policy. Um, what I find is that it's great to have a policy sitting there that demonstrates your senior leadership's support and understanding, support sponsorship potentially, and understanding of what you're doing and how you're doing it. So Len, oh, now we'll check to see. Len, you there? I am still on this line. Yeah, Bob, I'll let you, yeah, yeah, I'll let you know, Bob, as soon as he's back. Okay. 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 All right. So um, you know what? I mean, typically, you know, you want to look to see what other policies do you have in the organization. Uh, I've been asked to put together a policy for an organization. I see, and the first question I ask is, what policies do you have? Is there something that we could use as a framework for developing the policy that we're going to utilize within our organization? And how are policies being applied to people within the organization? Is it something that people are introduced to when they join the company? Is it something that's kind of reinstated or demonstrated through whatever communications tools that you're using for your organization? So, you know, see how people have reacted to existing policies before you go and you add another one. Or maybe it becomes part of your operational data policy. Or maybe you already have a records management or an information management policy that can be leveraged, can be improved by inserting some uh, uh, statements and some definition of what governance is. And even I've seen organizations go as far as including roles and responsibilities within their data governance policy. Oftentimes, I would see that residing within a program document or something like that. So, you know, look to see how policies are being used within your organization before you determine whether or not a policy is necessary. And then also learn from experience of your organization as to how they've activated other types of policies. Or maybe policies are something that just sits on the shelf and waits to be used. So, um, there's a uh, you know, figure out first and foremost. You know, do we need a policy? And then learn from experience as to what are you doing now with your present policies that have made them effective or have made them ineffective. Um, I, um, can you can you hear me now, Bob? I can. Good. So um, I completely agree with that about learning from experience. And uh, what I have found is that. Different organizations have different cultures, and um, so there's all different models about cultures of organization, but like one model said, hey, are you an innovative risk-taking culture? Are you an aggressive culture? Are you outcome-oriented? Are you a stability culture, people culture, team culture, uh, agility culture? These are some of the types of cultures. So look at the experience of what's worked. Uh, another useful way to see what you can do in a policy is to say, okay, do I need um, 
a guide. So do I need the policy to be a guide or a suggestion, or do I need guardrails, which is a strong suggestion, or do I need a policy that is governing or enforced or a very strong suggestion? So um, David Wells, one of our associate speakers, said, oh, think about the three Gs, guide, guardrails, or governing, uh, in terms of how to um, activate your policy, how strong does it need to be, and what works in your organization. Yeah, I like that idea. So you said guide, governing, and what was the third one? So guide, right. uh, small suggestions, guardrails, so not only guide, but guardrails, um, um, and um, being a stronger suggestion, and governing being uh, a, uh, a very strong enforcement type of culture. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's so, a great way to look at it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I could think of one telecom company I work for, which uh, basically, uh, guides work better. If you give a strong suggestion, very people-oriented culture, and if you really strongly enforce it, it, it won't work. Then I think of another organization that was more um, in that culture of uh, aggression and, and outcome-oriented, and, and there, the culture that really, that really uh, works well with policy, and it is spe specifically about data-sharing policy, was, uh, hey, you, you have to really, really be careful with this, and it's more about a governing policy. Okay, and, you know, and I think that, that makes perfect sense. And um, it, it, like, it, it, we, like we've been reiterating, well, let's look at what the culture of the organization calls for. Um, I always talk about trying to help people to stay non-invasive in their approach to governance. And you know, oftentimes if there's a policy in place and it's being enforced in such a way that it, it's really being very forceful and it, it may feel much more invasive than non-invasive. So right. uh, again, it becomes the, an organizational cultural type thing. Yeah, so um, you know, I love your approach about non-invasive data governance and that it syncs up with what I focus a lot on data governance on, on human dynamics of saying, hey, uh, uh, to make it non-invasive, implement, uh, develop and implement the policies along the same lines as what your culture is. Uh, by the way, you guys can look up all different cultural models, uh, or I have information on that, uh, to say, uh, look and see what the culture is in your organization, and if you follow that culture, it's, it'll be more non-invasive. Okay, and the, it'll be less invasive, I guess. Would be the way it would be more non-invasive, it would be less invasive. So it'd I think be less invasive. <laughs> less invasive. Right. right. So now let's talk about what are some of the things. So let's assume for a second that people that there's a need for a policy, and that it's going to um, that there, that you actually can't even get started until you have a policy. And so you take the time and the effort, you use models that you've seen, um, you've, you've made certain that it's required within your organization, and you've put the policies together. What are some of the steps that people can take to take it from being just a document on the shelf to something that is going to become useful to them in their everyday job or as, a, as again, one of those three, the guide or the guardrail or, the, or to be used for governing? So what can people do to activate their policies? Yeah, that's a great question. So what I've seen in my experience is numerous attempts sometimes at implementing a policy that seems to take forever. They get caught in a bureaucratic, uh, um, they get caught in a bureaucratic life, uh, cycle of, okay, let's draft the whole thing, let's go to legal, let's go to security, let's go to all these departments. Uh, what I think is one of the most important steps is get back to the big issue. Like we run data governance programs and one of the first things that we do is we, um, we provide uh, uh, issues of, of in, in organizations. So like for instance, in one organization, data sharing, and it, it very, very sensitive uh, in, in this association, I'm not gonna mention names of companies, but in this association, very, um, 
uh, very sensitive data. So it was, and, and that was one of their number one issues is sensitive data. Uh, so, um, so basically they, they established this sharing policy. In another organization, pharmaceutical company, it was actually the quality of information. And it gets back down to what's the reason for this? Well, if you get the quality of information wrong and you have a little bit of, uh, of data on John Smith in one record, and you get a little bit of data on John Smith in another record, and, uh, and you don't match them properly, people can die. So it's huge consequences. This was actually the, the one where we won the 2012 award for, and I, I can say that one because it's uh, Express Scripts Medco, uh, uh, where, where it was matching and, and, and making sure that you're setting a policy on data quality of not entering the same record more than once as much as possible. By the way, there's overmatching and undermatching. I just gave an example of, of undermatching. There's two different records. Then another is overmatching where you have John Smith and John Smith and it's two different people. So um, some, some, uh, some policies are around usage, some are around access, some are around sharing, some are around quality or integrity. But find the biggest issue that you can find in your data governance program. And that's a whole part of data governance is issues tracking. The biggest issue and say, where do you really need a policy? Once you do that, you write up the policy and you describe the reason in the policy. And like I said, those big four, the, uh, the reason, the why, what the policy is, and then culturally, how can I enforce this? Do I, which one of the three Gs do I use? Uh, how, do I, how do I enforce it? And then how do I monitor it? You know what, I'm with you 100%. I mean, I, uh, I'm working with an organization that's focusing on records and information management, and they started with the record with the RIM policy. Um, other organizations that are focusing on uh, protecting sensitive information, like you said, data quality, make your policy. You might not even need to call it a data governance policy. You might have an IT security policy that is already right. a form of governance. And so look for those, and again, look to see how are they activating these policies and making them um, valuable to people. But I think that, you know, it would be great if we could share some examples as to, you know, what, uh, what have you seen the policies be called? Or if they're not data governance, what are they called? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so I gave a few examples. One, one uh, that we created was called the data use limitations policy. So say, okay, uh, uh, to show when you have this, what can you not use this information for, like marketing or, uh, uh, or even internally? Um, so that's one example of a policy. Now, another example of a policy is a data access policy. You know, who is allowed access to what types of information? Now, uh, and so uh, one is a data usage policy. One is a data, um, uh, one, one other example is a data integrity policy. Another one is a data integration policy. Now, these all have to do with the data, but then there's also stuff that have to do with the processes. So in one organization, a large telecom company, we, uh, we actually had a very difficult issue gathering all the issues formally. People knew about all the issues, but they really didn't have their issues all laid out, which I believe is one of the biggest parts of a data governance uh, 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 plan is to lay out all your issues, get everybody together, uh, the Data Governance Council, and say and prioritize the issues and work up one issue at a time from the highest priority. Well, so one of the policies we implemented was a um, data governance issues management policy, which basically said that once you have an issue, the policy is is you have to formally report that issue. There were doing it all different methods, but formally report it through a process that we set up and through a system that we set up. Um, similarly, there was another policy about a process called the data definitions policy to say, wow, there's a policy to say, look, when you have a new piece of data, you have to define it. So these are more about the process than the, um, uh, than the end result. Uh, of course, could lead to a good and uh, could lead to a bad end result if you don't know what the heck data means or definitions or inconsistencies and stuff like that. 
So those are some examples of data governance and, policies. Uh, I just want to add one quickly before we go to the next um, the next topic. But um, I, I've seen organizations that have put a lot of time and effort into creating their business glossaries or their data dictionaries or their data catalogs, all these things that are very hot topics right now. And that once they've done, they've put the resources into developing those things, they decided that they wanted to create a policy around change management for this documentation. So if you are going to request to change something that has already been blessed by the people that needed to bless it, the stakeholders of it, if we're going to change it, we're just not going to give people the opportunity to change it. Now there is, and this is going to what you said, Len, it's going to the process of keeping these things up to date and making them viable within the organization. So if we're looking for a way to activate the policy, you know, one way may be for you to present something to people that in their daily job is going to impact them and kind of refer it back to why you're doing it. And, and the reason why yeah. you're doing it is that you have the management support for it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, actually, so um, this is an interesting one. Uh, uh, I, I did a project for the Colorado Community Colleges, uh, um, and uh, we were actually able to integrate information from many different um, universities and get standard terminology around a lot of their terms around the um, uh, student and financial data. Uh, they actually didn't have management support for this project, uh, and uh, many pieces involved in data governance. Uh, they didn't have management support in the beginning. But what they did is they took this huge need, because like uh, in budgeting, in, in the college budgeting, there was this tremendous lack of understanding about the data. And they basically were able to implement a policy about really labeling data that really made a difference. Um, in the end, they had management support. At the beginning, they didn't, but they showed the value. So sometimes, uh, even without management support, you, you know, everybody, I, I agree with you, Bob, like you need management support. But sometimes you can do things and show value and get management support after the fact. And that's true. I mean, sometimes they want that to be the case. They want you to demonstrate to them, you know, why is there even a need for the policy? And if you take something to them and say, we've, active, we've actually put the resources into this, you know, that we need to... Um, to again activate the policy and get it involved. It, it's not for everybody. Policies actually, there's not one consistent format that I've seen for a policy. There's a, oftentimes they pick and choose from some of the pieces that you mentioned earlier. So um, I think right. that's a real valuable, um, a valuable conversation as well. So the next thing that I wanted to talk to you about is kind of the relationship between the policy and data governance. So can you actually use a policy to drive data governance within the organization? If we're going to do that, you know, what's the best way to communicate with these folks? Is it to come from, like we talked about, top, either top-down or what you just described, which is the bottom-up approach. Is, there, is one of these better than the other, and what would you suggest? Well, um, so in our methodology for data governance, where policies actually fit into is uh, we have like six main major parts to the, to the data governance um, uh, um, methodology. It's, it's setting up the organization, it, it, it's issues, um, it's uh, data definitions, it's metrics, it's uh, uh, data quality, and it's solutions. And where policies come in is in the solutions piece. So once you, once you uh, identify the issues, once you see what's going on in all the different parts of the data uh, programs, there's a number of things you could do on solutions. One is you could set policies. One is you can change data. One is you can change processes. By the way, another big one is, is procedures. So we distinguish a policy from a procedure uh, that very often will have both a policy and a procedure about the same thing. So we'll have a data definitions policy maybe, like in one organization, to say, hey, you need to uh, have a policy to say, look, you have to label data. You have to give it some meaning. You can't just 
add a field to a database and not have any definition to it. Uh, and it can't be, like you always say, Bob, a cheeseburger definition. You know, uh, I got that from you, Bob, uh, <laughs> of uh, burger with cheese. Uh, it, 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 real definition. So that could be a policy. But then there's a procedure. So the procedure is the how. The policy is the what. Um, uh, and very often there's an associate. So basically um, what I'm saying is that uh, the, the, the policy is one solution, one thing we can do. So how it relates to data governance, this is one solution we can implement along with all these other things about uh, metrics and, um, uh, um, and, and then uh, I'm looking at some of the chat line comments about, uh, yeah, it depends on, on culture. So uh, depending on your culture, you know, I could think of one data governance job I was on where we didn't even implement policies because there were so many other things to do in the organization that was so much more powerful than implementing policy. So uh, really a lot depends on on your culture and on the issues and on the whys as to uh, if you implement policies, how you implement. Most organizations will implement some policies, uh, but it's it's a solution. It's one solution in the data governance program. That's how I say it. Do you agree? And you know what? I do it, it, because the, you know, if you think, it, it may come down to either even how you define data governance for your organization. And oftentimes in my webinars, I'll start out by giving definitions of data governance, stewardship, metadata, whatever we're talking about today. I thought we'd cut to the chase today. But you know, the idea is that you know, if, you need, if you need the data governance policy to be in place in order to do anything, that might be the first step. Or there's a lot of organizations that don't necessarily feel that th this is going to become an active document. And um, Yes, I agree. I think that uh, it really, again, depends on what's expected within the organization. And if you go back to the definition, as I was saying, I define data governance as being the execution and enforcement of authority over the management of data. Well, if it takes policy to execute and enforce authority over the management of data, and for example, right. and for example if you are going to um, Put, make this more of an information security or a privacy policy, or if that's where you're going to start, it becomes a no-brainer. Everybody knows that everybody is supposed to protect sensitive data or data that is classified a specific way. The policy can say that's what we're going to do. But if you're going to focus on something like information quality and you're expecting people in the organization to really change their behavior, in order to execute and enforce authority, it may be necessary because they're going to come to you and they're going to say, why do I need to do this? And you could say because right. it's in the best interest of the organization or you can say, well, management feels that this is very important, so we need to put this in place. Right. So uh, one thing that, uh, that I think is useful to look for is are there other policies uh, like I said, in my experience, to put together a data governance policy is actually a lot of work um, to actually get it there and get it enforced. And by the way, very often you do have to check with legal and other organizations. So to get something in place, uh, um, it, it, it's a bit of work. So the, the question is, is are there other policies and do they work? So there's many other policies aside from data governance policies. See what works in the organization. And then if those other policies work, okay, then, um, then that's a that's one effective solution to implementing data governance. If the organization is motivated and inspired by other things like results or relationships or um, uh, uh, you know, so you so you might it, yeah, it's really a question of how much time in the data governance program do you want to spend on policies. And you know what, your point is very well taken because it does take time. It does take resources. It, you're going to get people like your legal counsel involved. You may get HR involved in writing what are the consequences of not following policy. Uh, I've seen organizations that have things that they call policy management policies, which sounds kind of redundant, but it's a policy for how they're handling the policies within the organization. So again, it really depends on the culture of the organization as to whether or not 
you know, if you need to point back to the fact that you have a policy as a way to make certain that people are doing what they're doing. I had a, an organization I spoke to earlier today, some of their senior leadership have as a percentage of their performance evaluation that they're going to implement effective data governance around the specifics of what they're focusing their program on. And, um, and in order to do that, they say, okay, well then we need to have a policy. If I'm going to be accountable for this as being 20% of my job or 10% of my job, we need to be able to make certain that people um, understand that there is a policy in place and that it needs to be followed. So um, I think that uh, you know you can use governance to drive your or use the policy to drive governance. It's not necessarily necessarily the least invasive way of, of doing it. But it's it certainly, uh, if you have a policy, then somebody at the top has said this is necessary and it's worth doing the effort. And I've always, I've called it non-invasive data governance. Um, I don't necessarily say that it's easy and it's not, it doesn't mean no work data governance. It means that this is really the approach that we're taking to apply governance. Um, and you, if you're afraid of work or you might not be in the right business, um, the putting the policy together is definitely a bunch of work within the organization. Right, right. And you know, the other thing is, is um, unfortunately, I've been doing this a while, I've seen a lot of programs and I've seen a number of policies that frankly don't do anything. <laughs> and, uh, and, and you don't even know if they're doing anything. So like on this slide, you have a question, should the policy include measurements of success? Uh, and I'm gonna say to that, Yes, <laughs> yes, 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 absolutely. Like uh, if you have a program and you don't have any metrics, and by the way, we distinguish metrics from measurements. So the measurement is the type of thing you're measuring. Uh, the metric is the actual result of it. So like uh, for instance, a, a, a measurement might be violations. You know, we had three violations of the of the data sharing policy, you know, uh, the the the, uh, the so the metric is free, but the measurement is the type of thing, uh, or how many people refer to that policy, or how many questions were there. So if you're set metrics and there's absolutely no activity on that policy, uh, you 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 may it's like the old thing about reports. You know, I'm putting out a report, and uh, let's just delete it from the operational system. Let's see if anybody notices it, you know. Uh, that could be another thing on policy. Okay, uh, we're, we're going to uh, uh, not, even, not even look at it for a month. Let's see if it, let's see if it, uh, let's see if it was doing something. Uh, so absolutely, if you have a program where you're not measuring it, if you, it's really what data governance is about in many ways. It's about measuring and metrics. Um, yeah. So you really and want to use them in your policy. And, and I, you know, I've seen them included as well, and I think that becomes a very important thing. Again, you want to, if we're going to do this, if we're going to formally put governance in place, um, how are we going to know whether or not it's effective, and how, or whether or not, um, it, and people in the organization, if, if this is something that they want or need or even know exists. So let's jump into the last subject before we turn it back to Shannon for some Q and A. Um, the last subject that I wanted to talk about, talk to you about, was getting people to follow a data governance policy. Again, now assuming that we have a policy in place, you know, what are the things that we do? So, how can you share how the? Can you, or first of all, can you share how organizations effectively use policies? And you know, what are some of the techniques that they're using to get people to follow the policies? You know, we don't want that stagnant, passive policy sitting on the shelf. We want to get it active, get people to follow it. What are some of the things, that some of the, do you have any pointers for people as to what they can do in order to do that? Uh, absolutely, you know I do. That's a leading question. Because <laughs> uh, that's, uh, uh, frankly, I, I think this is the most important area, not only in policies, but in data governance. That, that the, I've been on, I've been on panels where they said, what is data governance? It's, it's, and, and you've heard me quote 20 years ago, it's not data governance, it's people governance. Uh, what we're doing, we can't govern data. You, you can't tell data what to do. It's going to do what it does, but we're guiding people. In, in, in people, uh, Bob, you were actually at my course in Enterprise Data World of, 
uh, on Monday morning where I talked about the whole course was about um, was about one thing. Uh, it, it, it was about instead of being about data mining, and I made a joke about this a long time ago, uh, not data mining like exploration of data. Uh, um, it's like it's my data. It, it's mine, 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 right? So it's one of the biggest issues in data governance, not only in policies, but in everything in data governance. Uh, hey, leave me alone. I'm working on a data science project. I'm working on a machine learning project. This is really important. Uh, uh, so leave me alone, and we need to get data hoursing, that this is a important, I made up that term. Uh, uh, this is an important piece of information that is really actually the company's, probably the company's uh, uh, piece of information, not any particular person's. So how do you get from data mining to data housing? I've actually spent like uh, decades looking at this and I came up with five things that I think are the most important things. I talked about it in my course. Uh, can I say what those five things are? Sure, please do. Okay. One, get really clear on the purpose, on the why, on why you're doing anything. So if you're going to have a DG policy, you have to link it back to the why uh, at, at that um, uh, project I told you, the pharmaceutical company. We link this policy back to the why of saving freaking lives. You don't have a, a – if you don't follow this policy – uh, there's a very, very, very strong lie. Uh, in other organizations, there's a big money lie. In other organizations, there's, there can be a risk lie. In an insurance company, they, they had said, uh, we talked to the vice president of marketing, you know, with our data governance and data management program. He said, you know, you guys don't know what you're doing. What you're really doing is you're stopping us from going to jail. That's what you're doing with this, you know. So a policy could be linked back to actually people not going, <laughs> I'm being facetious, you know, but not going to jail. You break a policy, like, wow. Uh, so it's the why. That's number one. Okay, so I'm just going to interject. So that's really, really relevant and really, really important because um, if it's not linked to the why, um, people are not going to really understand that what, what this is, you know, what's the purpose of it? What are we going to do? So I, I just think right. that, that, that I wanted to emphasize that point. It was That's a great point. Thank you. And by the way, people often think they're linked to the why. Why? Because we need better customer information. That's not the why. Why? Because we need better data quality. That's not the why. The why is something that's, that people really get their heads around. In the Colorado Community Colleges, the why was about educating students that they saw a direct link from getting standard terminology across 13 different regions and how that helped students increase their 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 learning uh, the why is, is it has to be really clear okay so that's one second um, people don't understand what is motivating people so uh, we always you know there's like 10,000 regulations on on data uh, um, uh, and then there's company policies, and then there's all this stuff. Policies are getting um, uh, not followed all the time. Um, but I have seen instances of, um, of policies being followed, uh, like that data sharing policy I talked about. People understood the why behind it. And what we do in our data governance program is one of the whole modules in data governance is organizational change. By the way, I think that's really important that to have a piece of your program dedicated to organizational change. Have a person or at least part of a person or, uh, or at least a program or something on organizational change. That seems to be the key. So there is a model that I shared with you on uh, Monday morning about how to understand people's motivations to know if they would follow a policy or not. That's second. Third is if you don't have trust in the organization, um, people won't follow policies. Oh, this policy is for the organizations or for the person who wrote it's sake or things like that. So there are frameworks for developing trust. Uh, uh, fourth, um, it's the way it's communicated. If you communicate, for instance, if you communicate a policy in legal, technical language, 
uh, you, that bird that you have on that slide, it probably won't be followed so much. <laughs> um, and and uh, <laughs> I like that graphic, by the way, you have both. Uh, and then uh, fifth is um, conflict. So um, uh, on one job in data governance uh, effort, uh, one of our data stewards got this nasty email from a, from a person. And, um, and it was basically she was getting in their stuff about really following policy. Uh, and uh, in this case, it wasn't a documented policy, but it was basically to say, look, you have to have a checkpoint in your project. Um, uh, so how do you handle a conflict? By the way, what she, nor what she did when she got this pretty nasty email is immediately started typing back, like, how dare you? How could you do that? And we're, we're in there. You have to follow our, our lead on this. This is authorized. This has top-level management commitment. How dare you? You know, you need to follow it. And before she hit the, the, the enter key, she, she listened to some of the training that we had about, oh, wait a minute. Uh, the first thing to do in a conflict, uh, uh, so Bob, you were at my um, talk on, uh, on Monday. What's the first thing to do in a conflict? Now I'm testing you. <laughs> don't, don't test me, please. <laughs> okay, I won't test you. First thing to do in a conflict is, <laughs> is we have to stop. We have to, we have to create some space that we're always jumping over each other. So somebody doesn't follow a policy, you don't go and say, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna escalate, I'm gonna ram it down somebody's throat. You need, oh, somebody just wrote in on the chat line, wait 24 hours, then reply, awesome, Gary. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 and by the way, sometimes this happens not in an email, but it happens uh, uh, directly, where somebody says, hey, your policy is uh, ridiculous, it's crazy, and you're ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> Get out, you know, d d we'll follow the policy as long as it doesn't uh, uh, take any time away from or budget away or any resources at all from our project. You know, right. so, uh, so um, even face to face, you can do that, like, uh, Bob, let's have some fun. Be mean with me and let's say I'm a uh, uh, data science project that says, uh, uh, get, get away from me, I don't want this. Hey, man, I told invasive you. or non invasive, just go away from me. <laughs> hey, man, I told you once, I told you twice, I told you three times, okay, that you need to go to the glossary and you need to go to the dictionary and the definition of the data. Or, you know, I've told you that this data is sensitive and you can only print it if you, you know, if you follow these rules to do it. And you're not doing that, Len. What are you going to do about it? Okay, here's my response. Big breath. <laughs> well, let me see. Hey, can I get on the same page as you and just, um, let me see if I really understand what's really important to you. Uh, and then reframe the discussion. Uh, is, it might be one possibility. Now, by the way, there's a whole bunch of ways I can handle that. But the first step is what everybody misses, is create some space. Uh, numerous people are actually putting in great suggestions on conflict. You know, check in to see if you're missing something. How do you drag a horse to water? How do you demonstrate the value of the policies? Uh, there's numerous approaches you could use. But the one thing I think we really miss the most is create space. Because what happens is there's a whole bunch of logical answers but we're operating on emotions. At that point, the, that data steward was operating completely on emotions. She might have even had a rational explanation behind why it was important to implement the policy, but she's emotional. She's, she's, act, she's reacting. Like uh, you had some place in the deck about how do you react. You, you don't react. You, you intelligently respond. And the only way you can intelligently respond is by creating some space to say, Oh, you know, um, uh, like in this uh, scenario that you were just talking to, I'm explaining it, Bob, instead of a role play, but, uh, but it's like, oh, you know, you're upset. This is important to you. Tell me, tell me why it's important. Okay. But would would that work? 
Yeah, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. But what I want to do is I see there's a lot of questions coming in, and we only have until the top of the hour. So let's try to get to some of the questions because I think that a lot of the people have questions that we can answer or that you can answer in the remaining minutes that we have. So awesome. um, I, I see that there's been a lot of chat going on and there's a lot of Q&A. Yeah, things. it's great. So, thanks, everybody, for chatting, and thanks for putting up with my Voice that's been coming first. And just as a reminder, these are the things that we talked about today. We talked about if it's necessary, when is it necessary to have a policy, the difference between an active and inactive policy, we talked about what does it take to activate it and using the policy to drive governance, and lastly, getting people to follow a data governance policy. And we could certainly continue the conversation on the data diversity, a data community, um, at, I think it's community.dataversity.net. Uh, we can certainly continue the conversation about that after the webinar. So what I want to do is I want to turn it over to Shannon in the time that we have remaining to do some Q&A on what we've talked about today. Great. Bob, thank you, and thank you, Len, for joining us today. And thanks, to, as I said, for all the great questions coming in. Just a reminder to answer the most commonly asked questions. I will send a follow-up email for this webinar by end of day Monday with links to the slides and links to the recording. Uh, so diving right in here, uh, could you list some of the common policies which are not related to any specific organization type? Oh, uh, okay. So common policies could be data usage. How, how can I use my data? Or uh, uses limitation. Uh, um, common policy is access. Who has uh, entitlement to what access? Common policy, uh, privacy, uh, security, which are two different things. Uh, integrity, integration policies, sharing policies. Then there's a number of policies on that I put in the bucket of process types policies. How to do data definitions, how to set up metrics, that you need metrics, how to set up issues, how to set up the measurements. Uh, uh, um, so there's a, there's a bunch of policies about setting up certain processes. So these are some of the most common ones I've seen. And you know, I'll just add to that that you know, the, any look to what you are trying to accomplish with your data yes. governance program, and and look to see if there's already a policy that's about that. Like the example I gave was the protection of sensitive or classified information. And so if the data is classified in such a way, let's focus on a policy first and, and make certain that we have our ducks in a row as we're getting started. It just makes sense. And uh, I thought that was a very good question. Yes. And by the way, along that, I saw one of the chats saying, are you talking about one large over, uh, overarching policy for DJ? I actually have seen that, but I prefer separate po the policies within DG, not one large overarching policy for DG. It depends on your organization, but that's how I, I've seen it mostly, uh, particular policies within DG. Okay. So this came in earlier. So this came in earlier. So what do you really mean uh, by passive versus active policy? Uh, I, I define that very simply. An active is something that is in force and that is actually being used. If it's in force but nobody is actually paying attention to it, I wouldn't it's, it's semantics how you define it, but, uh, but that's what you really want is not only it's in force, but uh, something is being done about it. I, some it, metrics. Uh, I'm behind him 100% in his answer. I don't have anything to add. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and speaking of taxonomies here, you know, uh, do you have a preferred policy versus standard? Is there a difference or do you have a preference? Uh, well, yeah, uh, standards actually can refer to a lot of things. We actually use that in a lot of things in data governance, like standards for uh, 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 for uh, semantics and things like that. Uh, a um, when I look at those three G's, you know, a policy usually a policy refers to the governing part. You know, it's not the uh, the guide or the guardrails. It's usually a, um, uh, something that is enforced. Uh, so standards, I, yeah, I prefer a, 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 a policy. Even when you look up the etymology of it, 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 it fits in terms of, wow, what, it, what it's really doing is regu regulating and controlling in, in a community. Uh, a standard, yes, 
It's a good question. It's another way to regulate and control, but I think there's so many things on standards, on data quality standards and, and uh, process standards, and um, so, so there's overlap there, but, but I don't think they're the same. And, uh, and I think if the bottom line is what you're trying to get to is to execute and enforce authority, um, there, it's not going to happen by itself. I use this line. I'm, I'm using it a lot on TDAN. I wrote an article now called that, that said called the metadata will not govern itself. Well, the fact is that the data will not govern itself. And so, we're, if we're expecting to manage data as an asset for the organization, then we might need some backbone, some teeth behind what we're doing. And that could be a lot of the time as to when. Um, when data govern, when a policy is necessary, and it might dictate how you're going to activate your policy. Yeah. By the way, Shannon, I saw somebody missed point number four. I think that was on the five points that I mentioned. It was about, uh, oh, it was about effectively communicating. And I actually give an acronym called SHARE. You need to be straight. You need to be helpful. That's the H. You need to know your audience. You need to know your reason. You need to be engaged. And then I use another acronym, uh, WAIT, why am I talking? Okay. <laughs> I love it. Well, that brings us right to the top of the hour, I'm afraid. So, um, but the good news is if you keep submitting your questions or if you have additional questions, I will get those over to Bob, who will write up some answers for us, and we'll, I'll include that in the follow-up email that I will send up by end of day Monday to all registrants with links to the slides and links to the recording. Bob and Len, thank you so much. Len, thank you for joining us this month. It's lots of fun having you on. And thanks to all of our attendees for uh, being so engaged in everything we do. We just love it. I hope you all have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Bob. Thank you, Santa, and thank you, everybody, for listening. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Bye.